you and welcome everybody. Okay, I think we started the recording. Um, wonderful. This is such a pleasure to join you from afar. One of the one of the treats um, of Zoom, even as sometimes we fight with technology. I think this is one of its affordances. Um, so this is uh, I'm coming to you as I mentioned in my chat from the East Bay, San Francisco. I'm in Emeryville on the on the other side of the bridge, for those of you familiar with San Francisco, and from Ohlone Lands. Um, and I, I begin the, the conversation by asking you all to share what home means. And I love the responses. Thank you for your beautiful um, engagement. And as I think about this work, and as, as I begin to share this work, um, and I'll, I'll begin to share my screen in just a second with the slides that I have prepared for today. Um, but the work that I'm doing is, is from a place of love, of deep respect and deep honor. And it's also um, from a place of experiential knowledge, being the child of immigrants um, from Mexico. And so this notion and concept of home and remaking home and um, renegotiating and navigating what home means, especially for Latinx youth, refugees, migrant and immigrant youth is of utmost importance. And so um, I love seeing where the chat, as Amy mentioned, so thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and begin my share of my slides. And let's see if this is all gonna work. There we go, wait. Give me one sec. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to move the screen to hopefully capture. Okay. You should see the slide on your full screen. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I, um, I, I have this, this artist, Chicano artist Ernesto Yerena, who, who's, uh, that's his art on the right there, the colibri, it's a hummingbird with the rose. My name is Rosa and it's a rose, but it's also really about flight and freedom. And so I just, um, it's one of the images that I use in my slides, but also one that I share with youth. Um, so the title of my talk is Of Cages and Wings, K-12 Latinx Immigrant Counter Stories in and Beyond School. Uh, and I, like I mentioned, I'm coming to you from the University of San Francisco with great pleasure. So I wanted to, to frame and begin this conversation uh, with, this, with the quote, which many of you may be familiar with, um, from Arundhati Roy. And uh, I wanted to actually jump to the second part of it. And uh, as I mentioned, you may have seen or heard this quote and, these, um, and her writings. But I wanted to focus on this last part of uh, not choosing to walk through this pandemic, dragging the carcasses of our prejudices and hatred and avarice and data banks and dead ideas or dead rivers, our dead rivers and smoky skies, that we can choose to walk that way or we can choose to walk lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And this is a collection, the work that we're, I'm sharing today is a collection and an inspiration in our aim to do just that, to reimagine what education could be. Um, and so the agenda is really an overview of the study itself. Um, it's a newer study. It's, I, I'm hoping to have it published re soon. It's still in, the, in progress, but I'm excited to share and build upon our co collective conversations today. And, uh, there's a picture of me during the summer program with a couple of youth and um, getting ready for our book, our book fair. So the problem, I frame the problem through a couple of layers, uh, through the pandemic, which uh, has had har harmful effects on working class children's education and socio-emotional well-being. For some youth, even for Latinx and um, other working class youth, um, there have been, uh, the pandemic wasn't always as uh, harmful in different contexts. In some ways, it created spaces for learning in a different way. But for many of the youth that we worked with, it was very harmful and uh, it had socio-emotional effects as well. Um, the other problem is around the 
anti-immigrant and Latinx racism. And so the policies that uh, harm and um, really demonize um, immigrants, Latinx youth, and Latinx communities at large, and the policies of, in the previous administration of the Remain in Mexico policy for refugees seeking asylum, and it carried into this administration. Um, there's been openings in different ways, um, but still these experiences um, are very traumatic and harsh for youth, um, many of whom, some of the youth who we worked with um, were part of this, uh, this, uh, this immigration from, that spent time in the tent camps. If some of you are familiar with the tent camps on the Mexico side of the border um, and also were in the US immigration detention um, on the Texas side of the border um, before migrating to the Bay Area. Um, so the last part is the school alienation, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I, I frame it that way because yes, we're looking at low achievement. Yes, we're looking at um, academic excellence or how to support our youth in educational success, but we also have to examine it in light of the ways that students are disproportionately um, experiencing schooling and pervasive deficit frameworks at play, um, as well as inequalities in structures and educational programming. So the study is a qualitative study, a participatory research study of a culturally relevant summer program with Latinx immigrant youth. And it's a university community partnership. Um, it began in that way in the last couple of years. Uh, the, the, the first year of the program was actually in 2020 at the height of the pandemic when youth were not in school and did not have online options either. So they were really at home without, uh, parents had their children at home or would take them to work with them. They didn't have school, they didn't have daycare. Um, but in the last couple of years during the transition, we've continued the program over the summer and incorporated some uh, tutoring and after school components. Um, but the study that I'm talking about today is really around the summer programs that we developed um, and that focus on this past summer and as well as the 2021 summer. So here are pictures um, on the left of, I'm in the middle there, and you see a few of my other faculty colleagues and also staff, founders and staff from the community organization, which I'm calling El Jardin. Um, and El Jardin was also the name of our summer program. Um, so that's the logo there in the middle. Uh, that we use on our t-shirts that we used um, for the program. On the right, we see our, um, our staff, one of the moms and one of the staff uh, members there of the organization um, making tortillas as part of the lunch. So it was definitely inclusive of families and communities who supported the program and uh, cultivated some of the logistics around getting it going. Uh, so the research questions, I'm going to focus on the first two, and the first two around how do K-12 Latinx immigrant youth perceive and participate in a culturally relevant and cultural arts program? And then secondly, what are the ways that culturally relevant program support youth's meaning making of their immigrant cultural and educational identities? So the first one is around how they're really experiencing it, and the second one is around how they're making sense of their own identities. Um, and then third relates to language literacy and socio-emotional strategies, but I'm gonna go less into that. I'm gonna focus on the first two and another, another article, another manuscript that would go into the literacy um, analysis. Okay, theory and literature, my work builds upon critical pedagogies and culturally relevant and sustaining pedagogies. And really what, um, what those are based and built upon is that an examination of schooling and of education as inherently political and not neutral, that society and schools are unequal by design, and that our, this focus, this Freudian humanizing focus is to alleviate human suffering 
And our approach to do that is through education that is empowering, that is liberatory. Um, and the very Freudian approach is by generating these generative themes that are central to students' lived experiences or what he calls reading the word and the world and culturally relevant and sustaining pedagogies which center knowledge, cultural wisdom, and the experiences of youth and families. Um, as I go through each of these slides, I may not read everything on the slide, but um, I just, I, just in order to get through um, and share some of the conversations about the study itself. The methods, um, so I'll begin with the data sources. Uh, participant observations and field notes for six weeks across the two summers. The program was held four days a week from 9 to 2.30. Um, and we conducted in-situ interviews or in-situation interviews um, across uh, the summer in terms of asking students to reflect and to think about questions related to the study uh, and their experiences. Uh, we looked at youth narratives, and those were written, verbal, or performative. And there were, uh, we took digital photographs and video. My role as the researcher and uh, was as participant observer. I was, in, I was an instructor of the high school newcomer immigrant youth um, group. So we, in the next slide, I'll share how we uh, grouped the youth. And so the work, the youth that I specifically worked with during the language and literacy curriculum part of uh, the program um, were these newcomer youth who, more, who were more recent immigrants. Um, at large, the youth themselves were either, were mainly children of immigrants or immigrants themselves. Um, and so that's sort of the larger context. And the data analysis includes active developing activity logs, domain charts, data triangulation, researcher memo, and member checking while developing um, a system of open coding followed by axial coding relating to the kinds of themes and codes uh, that uh, related to my research questions and my aims. So we see here, I have um, this cartoon image of the learning pods juxtaposed with uh, an image of youth who, you know, on this case in the, in the painting are on the backs of their families or the backs of their parents in the fields. Many of the youth that we worked with were farm worker children. Um, and during this pandemic, they, as I mentioned before, were without daycare or without schooling options or limited schooling options. And so this, this um, image sort of reflects that um, many families either took them to school or took them to work um, with them or um, uh, struggled to find ways uh, and leaving them at home with others or with family members while they worked. Um, so the setting and the context, the, it's a semi-rural, semi-urban. And I think it's important because we're, while we're in the Bay Area, this particular town is about an hour and a half away from our city center. And so uh, it's, it's, it has a lot of rural elements in terms of limited access to Wi-Fi. On one of my visits, just personally speaking, I was left stranded because I couldn't catch an Uber. And apparently, I, and I was just so, it was my norm of being living in the city in San Francisco. You can just sort of get on your phone, catch an Uber. And I was flying out to LA. And so um, one of the things that happened when I talked to folks there, they mentioned that you have to reserve the Uber a week in advance because there's only a couple of Uber workers that you have to reserve it from. And so I just, it was sort of a very new um, setting and realized it sort of, that was one of the examples that made me realize these juxtapositions of geography and um, access to things. And so, um, limited Wi-Fi in rural zones, parents were essential workers, exposing them to the illness or, and or these disparities of the pandemic were exacerbated um, by these, uh, by the already existing inequalities, right? Um, and I mentioned learning moved from online or moved from school 
to online and into homes. And you've had uh, many families were living either in a one room sharing rooms or multi-family dwellings in one home. And as I mentioned, the learning pods um, that many folks in San Francisco in wealthier neighborhoods were able to develop and carve out uh, learning pods as an alternative when there wasn't schooling options during the height of the pandemic. Okay, and so we began from that as the, the community organization El Jardin developed uh, and sought out this community university partnership to support them in developing the summer program. And then it continued beyond and as we move through the pandemic. So the program itself, I wanted to share, um, there's a sample schedule on the right. Um, the Jardin staff was immensely helpful and not just helpful, but really a foundation for the program itself, because they are the ones who built relationships. They're the ones who knew and know the children and the families deeply who work with them, who hold wraparound services, who have mental health services, immigration services they do. They're really the hub of supporting the Latino immigrant community in this, in this town. And, um, and so I think that that was part of the, um, foundation that we were able to come in and get to know folks, get to know the youth, get to know the families and build this program from that really strong foundation. So the curricular part was, uh, as I mentioned, culturally relevant, culturally responsive. Uh, we employed community cultural wealth models and lessons. And if you had a chance to read the article that was sent out, um, those are the article that I had written for the AERJ article um, demonstrated or illuminated the kinds of lessons and activities. And that one was conducted in a Central Valley, California. So this is a different context, but similar uh, curricular approaches where we used autoethnographies, um, translanguaging, ELD, cognates, and journaling um, students' lives, sharing their uh, voices and testimonials. And then the cultural arts, there was an array of workshops and classes that were part of this program and that the community sought out instructors. Most of them were volunteer, a couple of them were paid by grants, um, but the majority were local artists or local volunteers um, that provided painting with a Chicano artist, music, guitar lessons, um, the mental health counseling component was also really important, um, but that one was provided by the community organization itself and with the different, with the same university collaboration with the university where some of the master's students um, working on their uh, counseling certifications would intern there and work with licensed therapists. Um, and then other pieces involved soccer, sports, movement, and other kinds of dance. I wanted to share this picture. Um, the, the El Jardin Community Organization and the El Jardin is a pseudonym as are all the names I'm using, but the its, it's site is not an office in a, in a traditional sense, but a, but a house. And so the organization was really, um, uses the house as a the as the community organization, but it's in a neighborhood and it stands out as we call the little yellow house. As you can see, the gray homes around it and the gray skies of the, the marine layer. And um, uh, so I just think it's beautiful and it, it just sparks joy. Um, and some of the spaces we used were the office, the offices, the rooms in the home, in, in the organization, in the community center, as well as the El Jardin. El Jardin means garden. Um, and so there's a garden in the back, there's a tree. We set up tables, chairs. We had um, different groups of youth spread out across um, the rooms and in the center, inside in the driveway was another group. There was an office across the street and there was the garden. And so you get a sense. I want to share uh, 
a sense of the kind of space this was. Um, and then there's a picture of me with one of my slides and I'll share a closer look at the slide so you get a sense of the pedagogy. And, and then below is another example of the youth at the El Jardin learning uh, space. Okay, so this is just an example of the types of, of uh, uh, curricular approaches we would use. It's by, it's modeled after Linda Christensen's work um, and who talks about where I'm from poems. And it's a beautiful uh, text through Rethinking Schools. Uh, it's called Teaching for Joy and Justice. And, and so one of the approaches I use and that I worked with other, other instructors to develop is using when it relates to faculty or teachers who are of shared backgrounds then you use your autoethnographic experiences to help students make connections from immigrant experiences, culture, to literacy, to speaking, to reading, to writing. And so this was one, this was my poem. This was the poem that I shared. And in the tradition of Bell Hooks, who asks us as um, instructors, as researchers, as faculty to be willing to be vulnerable and have reciprocity of vulnerability and not just to ask our students to share their lives without sharing our own. And so that's my philosophy and my pedagogy. And so in this case, the slide shares just examples of soy de allá, soy de acá, I'm from here, I'm from there, meaning Mexico and, and the US. Um, and I share examples of platicas with my papa or talks with my father, loving books. Um, and the, the last line uh, of I am from, and this dicho, or it's a saying that I learned from the wisdom of my father, todo trabajo es digno, all work is has dignity, all work that is honest has, um, has dignity. And from my mom to seguir adelante, or to keep going forward, to keep moving forward. And, and so I used that, I shared it with youth, and then they shared the wisdom or the chose or sayings that their families taught them. So key findings that I wanted to share with you today um, are that youth experience this sense of liberatory learning and the healing space um, in our summer program that was unique from their educational and schooling experiences um, even prior to the pandemic and that youth were able to talk about, write, and process some of their immigration experiences through asset-based lenses and counter stories of resistance. And I share some because it's a process and it's something that is very delicate in nature, but also very important. And so youth um, shared what they wanted to share. And I didn't ask them, you know, I'll talk about this later, but I don't, the assignments aren't tell me about your immigration pain or tell me about your immigration story, but it's more about open questions and having students share what they would like to share. And as we build community and as we build trust and we build reciprocity, we find spaces of community, of healing, of shared stories, of shared resistance, of shared survival. Um, in this case, I wanna share a few examples from the younger, well, some of the younger youth, one of them is a teenager. Um, and then I'll share a few from the older youth or the newcomer youth. Uh, so Ismael, nine, um, shared about what this place means to him. What did the El Jardin summer program mean to him? And he shared, when I was stuck at home for a long time, during the lockdown and pandemic, I felt like I was in a cage, but when I came to El Jardin, I was inspired. And so, um, and then we hear from Gina, uh, el programa significa paz y felicidad, peace and happiness. And then Edgar shares that the program helps us learn and enjoy ourselves because it's summer and we need to take away all the stress that came out of the pandemic. And Manuel, at seven, shares, before I couldn't do anything, I felt bored, maybe depressed. It helped me get interested in, in stuff again. 
And I also just found it striking that at seven, he's sharing this language of maybe depressed. Um, and, and then I want to share another, you know, another example where, you know, it's not always um, roses and hummingbirds. <laughs> It's very tough work, right? And so part of liberatory humanizing pedagogies is meeting students where they are in their full humanity. So I want to share this example taken from my field notes about Miguel, who had a meltdown um, at the mere mention of seeing that reading would be would be um would be about, oh, where I was on the agenda. And so in general, he loves talking, he has rich analysis of ideas, but he struggles to read and write. And uh, so I gave him options. So I walked over, how about you listen to your group read? And he, he didn't want to do that. And, I, and later, I think I realized because he didn't want to be the one left out not reading or them to think he struggled with reading. Um, and so or he was an emerging reader. And so still he was pouting, hands crossed, frustrated, raising his voice. And so then I shared, I need you to talk to me without raising your voice. And another option is you can sit on your own, write in your journal or use the mindfulness box. So we created a mindfulness box for these moments where students could have, take a break, take a, take a walk with one of the um, undergraduate volunteer advisors, um, so there's a variety of strategies we used when these moments would happen. And he chose to move to another desk on his own, but he was still interrupting class. So one of our volunteer staff members, and actually this is one of the organization's community member, uh, one of the staff that I mentioned who's part of the community organization, who's known him since he was five, comes over and talks to him, takes a little break, takes a little walk with him. And sometimes Miguel would join the group and after, at the culminating celebration, he was so proud of participating in our class poem performance. And so I shared this example because, as I mentioned before, it's 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 hard work. It's not um, it's not always um, it's not always roses and hummingbirds, as I mentioned. So I wanted to share an audio, and let's see. Maybe someone can give me, I think it's, we tested it before, so it, it seemed to work. So I hope it's working again. The audio begins with one of the researchers asking the youth in Spanish, and then she responds in English um, about the summer camp and what it means. And I translated or I, I wrote the text there on the slide so you can read it, um, but I'll go ahead and play it. Quería hacer unas preguntas. Yes? Niñas, ¿me puede decir cómo se sintieron aquí en el campamento? Like, mm -hmm. Primero, ¿cuántos años tienes? Y luego, ¿cómo se sintieron? Okay. Okay. I felt free and, and loved it here. And I also love dancing. I love singing. I love playing guitar and stuff like that. Oh, and yeah. And thumbs up. Let me see. From, can you all hear that? Okay, great. One last one. Um, and I also was really, really, really happy, happy. And me sentía alegre. So we hear from Belen just share her joy. And um, and just even hearing her share her joy and alegría um, brings joy to my heart as well. And I'm going to move on now to Francisco, a teen, one of the newcomer youth. And on the left there, you see a little profile. He's 17. He was an unaccompanied minor. He, he's a little artist. He loves music. He loves writing lyrics. He loves songs from Latin America and Spanish and English. And one of the and he uses music as one of the ways to learn English. Um, and so Francisco wrote this poem. Um, and as part of our class uh, work and assignments about identity. And then he and I worked on his translation. And there were a couple points where he, you know, I thought of a different word and he wanted to keep a certain word and we'll talk about it in just a sec. Um, okay, I'll read it in, in Spanish and you can read it in English on your slide for monolinguals. Uh, yo soy revolución, soy pasión, soy de un sol. 
donde los sueños dependen del creador. Como me compongas, yo soy poesía, soy arte, yo me inspiro y no tengo límites. And so, and I mentioned the part about, you know, como me compongas, it's an interesting, like it's how you, you know, in whatever way you compose me, right? Or you think of me or you comprise me. And so he wanted, he was, he wanted to keep it as whatever you think of me. And that's what it meant to him. And, and I just think this, this sense of, he's not just asking about wanting revolution or change, but he's saying he himself is revolution. I just thought it was a really powerful poem and really reflects his talent and his artistry and the power of creating spaces for that voice and him to shine in that way. Um, Francisco also shared, you know, a quote that I'm going to share with you about what he hopes people would know about him and his journey. And what he shared was that we're not criminals. We're just kids looking for a chance to live. And I'm going to turn now to Eduardo, who in his journal, and they kept journals, daily journals, um, and on a weekly basis, they'd, they'd give them to me. I'd read them over the weekend, write that back, you know, dialogue journals. And they were, I, you know, sometimes I had a list of topics they could choose from, but really they were open journals. They could choose any of the topics. They could write about their day, about their experiences. And in one entry, uh, Eduardo wrote about his um, experience in the immigration detention camps. So they separated me from my mom and dad, even my little brother. We had two blankets of foil in a corner. We were desperate. They transferred us to another place called La Ferrera. They were like dog cages. Yeah, that's where we were. After that, everything was cold, gray, and black. All I had to hold on to was my family and faith that I would see them again. And I just, and I remember the deep, you know, I saw the images on television. I, I worked with immigrant youth for maybe 25 years um, as an educator, as a teacher. Um, and I think that this particular moment in history of these detention camps and the way that that affected kids and hearing his voice as one of those youth who went through that was just very deep and stark. And, um, and also just seeing it in relation to him being, there he is on the left, with his books and he's um, he went to a bilingual school in, um, in Honduras. So he already had a different kind of bilingualism and literacy and language that he came with and that was building and developing. But I just thought that he um, had a depth of maturity but also things he's gonna be healing from and reconciling because of what what's been done policy-wise and as a society from being a youth who was seeking asylum with his family. And, um, and then I wanted to share the final, in our, we, we had a culminating assignment or culminating performance where family came, where community came, where the big assembly, um, uh, and he shared this poem uh, called We Are El Jardin Youth. They say I'm not much, a guy with glasses, but behind those glasses, you'll find someone from Honduras who walked through Guatemala, through Mexico, and now is in the US. I tell you, never judge a book, never judge someone for how they look before knowing their story because each person, within each person lies a great history. We are El Jardin Youth. What gives us wings to fly? Our family, our stories, our education, and El Jardin community. Um, and then on the right, it's just, he's, it's his draft in, in our class space of him beginning to write out his, his poem. Um, and so we just see, again, resilience, survivance, um, and spaces for, for healing and spaces for um, working through that. So I wanted to uh, close with the discussion around and just leave, leave a few thoughts about final comments and points of, of reflection 
and analysis of what this means and what we do moving forward. So uh, the program shared a laboratory learning and healing space of feeling free, metaphors of flying and wings versus cages and isolation, how we approach Latinx immigrant education should acknowledge these immense challenges and tensions um, from a humanizing and cultural wealth lens. Um, but it's important to remember that critical pedagogies are a dynamic process. They're co-constructed with faculty, with teachers, with youth, with the community, with trust, with a deep reciprocity, deep relationships. Um, that it's not just about asking kids to share their lives. Um, it takes a lot of depth of experience to um, enact this, employ this. It's, it's what we want kids to have, but it's also, it takes much intentionality um, and skill and experience to develop. Um, I also wanted to point out around the immigrant diasporas that were an intersectional transnational identities of what youth are building and rebuilding and re renegotiating for themselves. Um, and, and then how can we build these kinds of socio-emotional learning into school curriculum or into school supports that, um, that will help us educate and empower Latinx youth as we continue to navigate the pandemic and the social ills of continued racism and anti-immigration. Um, and then the community partnerships piece, as I mentioned, was really important because it also provided a lot of these wraparound services um, that we often don't see um, in schools on their own. And my future project with this work and with this group that I'm um, planning for next summer, we continue to do the, the summer program, but I want to add Latinx youth as junior oral historians to document their family um, and community stories. There have been many parents and families who've come to the organization sharing that they want to um, share as adults their experience. And so we're working on a project related to that. And that is my closing. So thank you very much for having me. And I would like to open it up for questions, for comments, reflections, and discussion with you. All right, so uh, those of y'all at the GSE, do y'all want to uh, take the lead on um, facilitating the questions? Sure. So we have one. They can hear us, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, they can hear. Okay. Uh, I really appreciate the aspects of uh, community outreach, especially in uh, a very large Hispanic community. I know growing up uh, as a first generation American uh, Chilean, uh, in my town, uh, I live in Union City, an overwhelmingly Hispanic town. Uh, <clears throat> there seems to be a large amount of, uh, or rather a lack of community outreach in terms of programs that reach a broad audience that isn't just like preschoolers. And I feel like what you're doing with reaching out to a wide range of uh, youth is really impactful for me because it's something that really wasn't really done during the time of the pandemic, or really while I was growing up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that especially older youth tend to, older meaning, you know, middle school, teens, high school youth. Um, and actually, I come to this work as a bilingual social studies middle school teacher, secondary teacher from Los Angeles in LA. And so, you know, I know you probably see a lot of that sort of my teacher pedagogy. Thanks, Brittany, I see you. Um, I, you know, a lot of that in my presentation and just my way of engaging this work and my research. Um, because yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's so important to, and it's just my area, right? Each area is important. Each age range, each group matters. They each have unique needs and um, strengths and, um, but, but yeah, I think that part of the 
part of what supported our work, as I mentioned, and my interest in working with newcomer youth and high school youth, secondary youth, um, a huge part was that this community organization, El Jardin, had already been working for about 15 years with this community. And they began out of, you know, the co-founders were doing this work without an actual location. And they were just providing services and supports and they began to build and, and they began to grow and they began to um, finally like, uh, maybe I think it was five years before our first summer program that they had the little yellow house was like a huge uh, component to having a site. But I say that to say, to outline that because of that foundation, we were able to come in and then they had already built the relationships where we could come in and then build our relationships with them. But it's it, that piece was so important um, to have trust and reciprocity and um, genuine engagement for the young kids and for the teens and for the high school youth. And as I mentioned, we had undergraduate. It was very, that's another component that I didn't get into as much today, but we're hoping to reexamine is this piece around intergenerational um, relationships and intergenerational ways of uh, belonging and how youth supported each other in that way and how undergrads supported high school youth and how sort of these, these different components of intergenerational reciprocity. Um, yeah, other questions, comments, or reflections, feel free to drop them in the chat or, or go ahead and and flag, raise your hand. I'm up here, or maybe we should take one from online. Uh, are there any questions online and then we can swing back to the room? It doesn't have to be a question, it can be impressions, reflections. Uh, uh, go ahead, Jahan. All right. So uh, think, first of all, thank you very, very much. Very impressive work and uh, very inspiring work. Um, second, I think my question is, so you joined this uh, organization, and before you attempt to work with them on the academic level, was there any support academically? Or was it all social to just support the community socially? And then you introduced the academic side to it. Uh, because when you talk about uh, the uh, critical pedagogy, right? And then how you introduced the academic side, was there any previous knowledge of that to support what you were doing or your uh, attempt to support the community on that level due to COVID uh, was the first exposure to such experience? So thank you. Um, and, what, and what was your name? Jihan. Thank you. Um, so the community organization was already doing wraparound services but it was wraparound services based on different social programs, right? So like immigration supports, uh, counseling and psychology, um, food and clothing uh, supports, um, relocating immigrants to families and uh, supporting unaccompanied minors and that kind of thing. And what occurred was that during the pandemic when, um, and so they didn't have an educational component um, but they did have a philosophy of, you know, their the philosophy is building building and supporting Latinos uh, through an asset based lens, and so they they already had that that was part of the ethos of deep humanizing love and care and reciprocity that was embedded in their practice. But they didn't have the educational piece around supporting educational programming or educational supports with youth, those, those pieces began from a response to parents at in the 2020 year when the lockdown of the pandemic happened. And so when the lockdown of the pandemic happened in this particular region, and I know it's different in different places, but in our this particular region, 
um, schools shut down and everything was on lockdown and they did not have schooling for, uh, I think it was February to June. And so then in the 2020 summer and prior to that, the organization heard from parents and families, we have no daycare, we have no school for the kids. The schools, the kids are depressed, the kids are isolated. There is nothing occurring. And so that's where I mentioned the learning pods that many wealthy or white families or soci or even multiracial wealthier families created learning pods for com communities and kids. And these kids did not have that. And so they reached out to the university and we had partnerships with them already in terms of us knowing this community organization and what they were doing. And we developed curriculum for the summer program. And the curriculum and the teaching incorporated a lot of arts and a lot of uh, re-engaging youth, socializing youth. And there were academic pieces we included, but it wasn't like a mirror, like a school setting, in part because it was summer, but also because youth had been through a lot of trauma, both through the pandemic and immigration related. So that was our vision. There were pieces and elements that I mentioned as my third research question that I analyzed in another study. I mean, the same study, but in another paper um, around the ways we worked on translanguaging and English language development and emerging bilingualism. So I didn't get into as much today. So hopefully that addresses a little bit of your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Although I have a follow up, but I'll give the chance to uh, the others to ask. Okay. We're also wanted... continuing to um, partner with the district, but it's been very difficult um, with the district and the community relationships. Um, there's a lot of dis there's a lot of juxtaposition of social class, race, wealth. There's a lot of disparity. There's a huge um, uh, the community is like the farm worker community that's left Latinx and immigrant, very working class. And the district is uh, uh, starkly shifts from, has a, has a huge Latinx immigrant population, but then it also is, is juxtaposed to a wealthy community. Because we're, we're, as you see, as you see my, this is not the community, but as you see is like the Bay, it's near the Bay Area. So there's a lot of barrier of wealth. And so there's there's a lot of tensions around that. Other questions, thoughts, or reflections? I know we're getting close to time, but maybe any closing? Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to say how amazing it is that you and everyone involved that you were able to accomplish what you have accomplished. I feel like there is so much seed there in what you have just presented for so much more in every direction possible. And I just, from I have come from a journalism background. So just the mere fact that you have been able to document their stories and now amplify their stories with an audience like everyone who's gathered here today, that is just so powerful. You have managed to empower the weakest by being able to be in the position that you are in, being able to be sympathetic, and then now being the liaison between them who will not have the opportunity, they will not have the opportunity to meet us, and we are educators, we are doctors. We are in high positions in education by comparison, and they are the newcomers. They are the ones who, many of whom may not even speak the language at all. And I just see so much promise in the work that you're doing and so many directions to go. I encourage you not to be discouraged by what you were just mentioning in terms of the politics and um, the different districts that, that may not understand come from backgrounds. I, I look forward to a time when the kind of work that you're doing and so many others who are interested can influence the system to not perceive those students as the problem because they are so brilliant. They have all the odds against them and yet they express themselves so well in spite of. They are so resilient, but the way we approach education 
is to now look at those students as the reason why the school district is low performing. Look at those students as the ones that cannot excel on standardized tests and therefore bring down the school district. And they're looked at as such a liability. And that's just really unfortunate because they are so brilliant. And so again, I just want to applaud you and encourage you in to not look too wide, but to stay focused so that you can keep making a difference by just focusing and accomplishing that that little bit that means so much. Thank you, Shauna. That was beautiful. I feel like that was such a beautiful closing. I really take that to heart. Thank you so much. I have a question, if I can go. Hi, I'm Cynthia from um, the Graduate School of Education. Um, my research focuses on undocumented um, college students. And one of the things that I have a hard time um, interacting with is the fact that when we write academic work, most of that is our research and our findings are pretty much accessible for academics um, and not necessarily accessible to the community, right? So I would love to hear um, some recommendations as I think about you talking about the parents of the youth, um, how you can see your work being accessible, not just between us, but um, the community. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's, that's really important. And, and remind me your name. Cynthia. Cynthia. Let's see. And are you online user. or are you in the in-person group? I'm in the in-person. Oh, okay. Okay. Hi, Cynthia. Uh, that's such a good question. Um, so one of the approaches we take at, um, at the University of San Francisco in our School of Education, we offer and we look at um, our work through a lens called public scholarship. Uh, and so it's, we, yes, we have research and scholarship that we do, you know, like the AERJ article or other articles you might read that I've written or that others write or that we read and we're trying to publish for academic audiences, right? That's, that's one path. That's one uh, avenue. That's the work that we're doing. There's a way you can be critical and flip the script within that and still be within the academic circles, but it's for a particular audience. And so I, what we do in our work through public scholarship is to think about what are the ways you, you know, translate or you make this accessible through uh, alternate pathways or other pathways. And so, for example, that could mean through, um, for example, educational magazines or articles, through professional development, through, um, you know, podcast, I've done podcasts before too. And so what are ways that we do that? I think that's going to depend on your community and your purpose. So for example, for our work, what we've done is we've gone into the district and we presented the work to, um, to, the, to the principal leadership. And then they're thinking about how do we help teachers who may have deficit perspectives? We know that they do, not all, but our youth who you just heard from are artists and writing and also emerging literacy and emerging bilinguals, but have shared stories of great feeling very defeated because as Shauna mentioned, they are judged by their test scores. They are judged by their lack of English, academic English. And so I think that public scholarship and, and getting that into different spaces is important. And so um, what I would say, Cynthia, is for the, if you're working with undergraduate or the graduate levels of uh, undocumented uh, uh, students, is to think about who are the communities you're trying to get this work to? Is it policymakers? That could be like a policy brief. If it's the community that you work with themselves, can they do like one of my one of my classes? They just made a zine, you know, one of these um, e like e magazines called the zine, and wrote up their poems and their narratives and their testimonials, and they wrote that for each other to get out to other uh, college youth about their stories and narratives. So I think it's important to think about your audience and what purpose you want to translate that research into. I think they're both important. 
or more than the multiply important. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're at time and I want to respect everyone's time, but I am I am happy to stay after if anybody wants to chat. I, I also wanted just to, to close with a deep heartfelt thank you. And um, you know, and my my are you my USF alumni Olivia, who's in Vienna, is um not here, but I know she'll watch later. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all at Rutgers for having me um and allowing me to share my work with you. Um, it's a labor of love and it's one that I continue to do and feel free to reach out and, uh, connect. I'm happy to connect with you and, um, and sending you all much love and restorative energies during this holiday season that's coming up, but also as you turn the corner to wrap up the semester, um, take it easy and take extra care because it can be a stressful time for all of us. Thank <laughs> you.